Welcome to On Fire. This is the On Fire podcast. I'm your host, Ryan Allen. Hey, it's, so it's it's been a long time since I made a Star Wars reference, but uh, I'm going to. Uh, so in A New Hope, uh, we see Obi-Wan Kenobi and Darth Vader seek each other out on the Death Star. They, they have, uh, they, they light their lightsabers and they, they have a, a less than impressive by today's standards uh, lightsaber duel in which Obi-Wan looks feeble and outmatched and Darth Vader knows that he's going to win and, and he taunts Obi-Wan. He says, your powers are weak, old man. To which Obi-Wan replies, you can't win, Darth. If you strike me down, I shall be become more powerful than you can possibly imagine. And then uh, after a few more uh, lightsaber clashes, Obi-Wan sees uh, Luke Skywalker watching the duel and, and proceeds to allow himself to be uh, sliced in half by Darth Vader's lightsaber. Um, then Obi-Wan's body disappears as he's struck, leaving just his robe and lightsaber behind. And from there on out, he can assist Luke as a, as a Jedi spirit. Uh, he's gained greater power than he had uh, as a mortal man. So in our world, when a body and a spirit separate um, in death, the, the righteous spirit goes on to continue his or her work uh, in the world of spirits, sometimes interacting with the living, but mainly uh, working among spirits. And according to the scriptures, there are other types of beings besides regular mortals and, and spirits. Now, if I could have given George Lucas some ideas while he was writing the script for Star Wars, I would have suggested something different. Translated Jedis. How cool would that have been? I know I'm, I'm a total dork and I realize that this is not news. So let's just uh, deal with that and move on. Um, in the previous podcast episode, The Rise of Zion was the title of it. Um, I talked a little bit about Enix and Melchizedek's people who were translated as well as the, the three Nephite disciples who were translated. Uh, I want to discuss translation a little deeper in this episode and see how it might pertain to our day. I think it's interesting how Mormon, as he's abridging the Nephite record, uh, writing the Book of Mormon, he isn't quite sure how to describe translation. Uh, he's talking about the three Nephite disciples um, who, who the Lord had chosen and who were translated. Uh, he says this, this is 3rd Nephi 28, starting in verse 13. And behold, the heavens were opened, and they were caught up into heaven, and saw and heard unspeakable things. And whether they were in the body or out of the body, they could not tell, for it did seem unto them like a transfiguration of them, that they were changed from this body of flesh into an immortal state, that they could behold the things of God. But it came to pass that they did again minister upon the face of the earth. And then later in the chapter, he expounds with the new information that he's received after he's sought that out, because this was kind of new to him. So down in verse 36, says, And now behold, as, you, as I spake concerning those whom the Lord had, hath chosen, yea, even three who were caught up into the heavens, that I knew not whether they were cleansed from mortality to immortality. But behold, since I wrote, I have inquired of the Lord. And he hath made it manifest unto me that there must needs be a change wrought upon their bodies, or else it needs, that it, it needs be that they must taste of death. Therefore, that they might not taste of death, there was a change wrought upon their bodies, that they might not suffer pain nor sorrow, save it were for the sins of the world. Now this change was not equal to that which shall take place at the last day, but there was a change wrought upon them, insomuch that Satan could have no power over them, that he could not tempt them. And they were sanctified in the flesh, that they were holy, and that the powers of the, of the earth could not hold them. And in this state they were to remain until the judgment day of Christ, and at that day they were to receive a greater change, and to be received into the kingdom of the Father, to go no more out, but to dwell with God eternally in the heavens. Uh, it's easy for, uh, for it's easy to confuse uh, being transfigured and translated like Mormon did initially and wasn't sure about mortality versus immortality. But the two words transfigured and translated sound similar and, and they mean uh, they mean something similar. Um, the, the church website defines transfiguration this way. The condition of persons who are temporarily changed in appearance and nature, that is lifted to a higher spiritual level so that they can endure the presence and glory of heavenly beings. So that's tra being transfigured or transfiguration. Uh, an example of this would be Moses on Mount Sinai. 
uh, he saw and was in the presence of Jehovah uh, while in the flesh. So he required transfiguration in order to endure the encounter. Um, the effects of it were temporary, but when Moses returned to the camp of Israel, his face shone or it was bright and shining and white. Uh, the effects of transfiguration hadn't yet worn off. And the children of Israel saw that uh, in his, his face and countenance. Um, another occasion, uh, Jesus took Peter, James, and John onto a mount, and there they beheld Moses and Elijah, and, were, and they were transfigured. Jesus and then Peter, James, and John were transfigured. Uh, Moses and Elijah were translated by that time, which is much longer lasting than transfiguration. And Jesus, Peter, James, and John were transfigured in order to behold them in their glory. Uh, they were heavenly beings and, 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 and appeared in their glory. So uh, Moses and Elijah were translated when they had completed their mortal missions. Um, it was necessary that they retain their physical bodies because they needed to transfer priesthood keys by the laying on of hands, which they did to Peter, James, and John. So it would be about six months before Jesus would be the first to be resurrected. So translation was necessary so they could physically lay their hands on Peter, James, and John's heads and bestow priesthood keys. As that was the purpose of their being translated, or at least one of the purposes. Um, Moses and Elijah also appeared as translated beings to Joseph Smith and Oliver Cowdery in the Kirtland Temple for the same purpose of bestowing priesthood keys on them. Uh, so when... When the Lord sent messengers uh, to his prophets before Jesus was resurrected and they physically interacted with, with those prophets or with people, um, as in the case of uh, the, the men who visited Abraham and who saved Lot's family from Sodom, uh, if you remember those from our, our recent Come Follow Me studies, um, those, those two who uh, were in Sodom and the people of Sodom wanted, wanted to, uh, to assault them, um, and so th those people, and then, uh, the person with whom, uh, Jacob or Israel wrestled, we can assume that these were translated beings, messengers from God that, that, um, that interacted physically with mortals. So transfiguration is temporary for certain events and, and translation can last for thousands of years as in the case of Enoch and Melchizedek and Moses and Elijah and the three Nephite disciples, um, they, their translation was a long time ago, and and we can assume it, that they are still that way. So a, a translated body is technically mortal, but it is different from a mortal body like ours in that it is no longer subject to the natural laws of this earth. It doesn't age. It doesn't get sick or die. Um, the person is no longer subject to the temptations of Satan or to the sorrows of, of earth life that are common to you and me. Um, a translated being is also not bound to this earth. They, they're able to travel to other worlds and minister there. They're, they're of a terrestrial order. Uh, so Joseph Smith taught this, quote, many have supposed that the doctrine of translation was a doctrine whereby men were taken immediately into the presence of God and into an eternal fullness. But this is a mistaken idea. Their place of habitation is that of the terrestrial order. And a place prepared for such characters he held in reserve to be ministering angels unto many planets, and who as yet have not entered into as great a fullness as those who are resurrected from the dead. Close quote. So that's kind of the difference between a celestial being and a, a translated being. They are terrestrial. So on my mission, I, I, I taught quite frequently erroneous doctrine. Uh, as I suspect thousands of others have also done, maybe, maybe you did. Um, but hopefully if you haven't served a mission yet, uh, you, you won't. Uh, so I taught people that when the great apostasy occurred after the death of Jesus' uh, Jesus's apostles, uh, or translation in the case of John, that the priesthood was taken off from the earth. And that is not accurate. Uh, President Joseph Fielding Smith taught this, quote, Moreover, the Lord of necessity has kept authorized servants on the earth bearing the priesthood from the days of Adam to the present time. In fact, there has never been a moment from the beginning that there were not men on the earth holding the holy priesthood. Even in the days of apostasy, and apostasy has occurred several times, the Lord never surrendered this earth and permitted Satan to have complete control. Even when the great apostasy occurred following the death of the Savior's apostles, 
our Father in heaven held control and had duly authorized servants on the earth to direct his work and to check, to some extent at least, the ravages and corruption of the evil powers. These servants were not permitted to organize the church nor to officiate in the ordinances of the gospel, but they did check the advances of evil as far as the Lord deemed it necessary. Close quote. Okay, so hopefully it makes sense what translation is or what uh, translated uh, bodies are. Um, but what does this have to do with us? What does it have to do with our day, uh, the last days? Uh, president John Taylor, uh, the third president of the church in this dispensation, spoke on this topic quite a bit. Um, let's look at some of his words. He said the following, quote, How perfect it was in the days of Enoch, we are not told. But everything that they had, re had revealed to them pertaining to the organization of the church of God, also pertaining to doctrine and ordinances, we have had revealed to us, excepting one thing, and that is the principle and power of translation. That, however, will in due time be restored also. And if they in their day built a Zion, we have to build one in our day. And when this shall be done and everything is in readiness, the Zion which the people of Enoch built and which was translated will descend from above and the Zion of the latter days which this people will build will ascend by virtue of this principle and power, and the former and the latter-day Zion will meet each other, and the dwellers in both will embrace and kiss each other, so we are told in the revelations of God. Close quote. Uh, so in, in the previous podcasts, um, the rise of Zion, we talked about Enoch Zion and its, and its return. Um, but I, I think it's interesting uh, that John Taylor observes that the principle and power of translation uh, is, is not something that that we have or exercise at this point as a church, but will be restored uh, in the last days. Let's look at something else that John Taylor taught. He said this quote, we have had in the day, excuse me, we have had in the different ages, various dispensations, for instance, what may be called the Adamic dispensation, the dispensation of Noah, the dispensation of Abraham, the dispensation of Moses and of the prophets who were associated with that dispensation. The dispensation of Jesus Christ when he came to take away the sins of the world by the sacrifice of himself. And in and through those various dispensations, certain principles, powers, privileges, and priesthoods have been developed. But in the dispensation of the fullness of times, a combination or a fullness, a completeness of all those dispensations was to be introduced among the human family. If there is anything pertaining to the Adamic or, or what we may term more particularly the patriarchal dispensation, it would be made manifest in the last days. If there was anything associated with Enoch and his city and the gathering together of his people or of the translation of his city, it would be manifested in the last days. If there was anything associated with the Melchizedek priesthood in all its forms, powers, privileges, and blessings at any time or in any part of the earth, it would be restored in the last days. If there was anything connected with the Aaronic priesthood, that also would be developed in the last times. If there was anything associated with the apostleship and presidency that existed on this continent, it would be developed and in the last times, for this is the dispensation of the fullness of times, embracing all other times, all principles, all powers, all manifestations, all priesthoods, and the powers thereof that have existed in any age or any part of the world. For those things which never have been revealed from the foundation of the world, but have been kept hid from the wise and prudent, shall be revealed unto babes and sucklings in this, the dispensation of the fullness of times. That's the end of that quote. That's pretty powerful. That is... Uh, that's a lot. There's, as we, as we study the scriptures, anything, any power, any priesthood, any doctrine that it has existed in previous dispensations will be restored and revealed in this dispensation. So John Taylor also made these two related statements. Quote, now the doctrine of translation is a power which belongs to this priesthood. There are many things which belong to the powers of the priesthood and the keys thereof that have been kept hid from before the foundation of the world. They are hid from the wise and prudent to be revealed in the last times. Close quote. And then this one, quote, Enoch was not, for God took him. And we may add Enoch's city and Enoch's people were not, for God took them. They were translated. The principle of translation was a principle that at, at, that, at that time existed in the church and is one of the principles of the gospel in which will, sorry, 
and is one of the principles of the gospel and which will exist in the last days, close quote. So our, our, our previous podcast was about the Zions of the past and the Zion uh, we are charged with building in the last days. And anyone who has, has studied the last days knows of, of the calamities and destructions and war that have been prophesied of for thousands of years in relation to the, the days preceding the Savior's second coming. In the Book of Mormon, we read about huge upheavals and natural disasters that, that destroy entire cities, uh, coinciding with the death of the Savior when he was on the earth uh, the first time. So these are given as, as a type of things to come. If the earth is, is going to transition to a terrestrial world at the second coming of the Savior, all things that are telestial, including people, must be cleansed from off the face of the earth. So how are the saints of the last days supposed to exist and survive these things, not to mention gather the righteous uh, to Zion with all of this going on? Let's look at one, one more quote from, uh, from John Taylor. Uh, he said this, Here we are. We are organized under the direction of the Almighty, and as I said before, not according to our ideas and notions, but according to the word and will and revelations and law of God. And none of us can do anything only as God permits us. What are we going to do? We are going to build up Zion. What then? When Zion is built up, and it is not built up yet, but it will be built up. And when that is done, Jerusalem that is spoken of shall be built. And we are a long way from that. But when that is built, built up and the glory of God shall rest upon it, upon every dwelling of Mount Zion, as it did in former times, then we will build up our Zion after the pattern that God will show us. And we will be governed by his law and submit to his authority and be governed by the holy priesthood and by the word and will of God. And then when the, when that, and then when the time comes that these calamities we read of shall overtake the earth, those that are prepared will have the power of translation as they had in former times, and the city will be translated. And Zion that is on the earth will rise, and the Zion above will descend, as we are told, and we will meet and fall upon each other's necks and embrace and kiss each other. Close quote. I don't think I've heard or, or read anything specific about exactly uh, when this occurs, but it will begin before the Savior comes. Um, we do know from the, the book of Revelation and the Doctrine and Covenants about a group of people who will be instrumental in gathering the righteous to Zion, and they're referred to as the 144,000. Uh, this is what it says in the book of Revelation, uh, chapter 7, starting in verse 1. And after these things, I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to the four angels, to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed an hundred and forty-four, a hundred, an hundred and forty and four thousand of all the tribes of the children of Israel. Um, the prophet Joseph Smith taught that the sealing of the faithful in their foreheads, quote, signifies sealing the blessings upon their heads, meaning the everlasting covenant, thereby making their calling and election sure, close quote. So that's what, that's what that sealing in their foreheads means. Uh, we get a little bit further um, detail from uh, the prophet Joseph Smith as he is inquiring of the Lord, and this is recorded in Doctrine and Covenants 77. Uh, verse 11 question what are we to understand by the sealing of by the sealing the 144,000 out of all the tribes of Israel 12,000 out of every tribe answer we are to understand that those who are sealed are high priests ordained unto the or, un, ordained unto the holy order of God to administer the everlasting gospel for they are they who are are ordained out of every nation, kindred, tongue, and people by the angels to whom is given power over the nations of the earth to bring as many as will come to the church of the firstborn. And we talked about what the church of the first, firstborn is in uh, the podcast episode. Um, I believe it was uh, Seek My Face. I think that was the episode we talked about that. 
so the mission of the 144,000 is to administer the everlasting gospel, not necessarily to preach it, but to administer it. Uh, they're, they're called as hunters and gatherers. They, they seek out those who are worthy of Zion. They bring as many as, as will come out of calamity and war and danger to the church of the firstborn. So they, they, they bring or deliver them to where the elect are gathered, which would be Zion. Uh, they also have power over the nations of the earth. What does that mean? Um, could it mean that they are translated? Translated beings certainly fit that description. Uh, they, they would have power over the elements and, and over their enemies. Uh, so back to 3rd Nephi 28, as, as Mormon is talking about uh, the three Nephite disciples who were translated, um, he, he gives a summary of the power that they had. And, and he says this, this is starting in verse 18. They did go forth upon the face of the land and did minister unto all the people, uniting as many to the church as would believe in their preaching, baptizing them, and as many as were baptized did receive the Holy Ghost. And they were cast into prison by them who did not belong to the church. And the prisons could not hold them, for they were rent in twain. And they were cast down into the earth, but the earth did smite, sorry, but they did smite the earth with the word of God, insomuch that by his power they were delivered out of the depths of the earth, and therefore they could not dig pits sufficient to hold them. And thrice they were cast into a furnace and received no harm. And, and twice they were cast into a den of wild beast, beasts, and behold, they did play with the beasts as a child with a suckling lamb and received no harm. Now that sounds to me like a similar mission to that of the 144,000. One day, I'm sure we'll hear more of, of their miraculous ministry. It, it will be better than any movie we've ever seen or, or thriller novel we've ever read. Uh, talking about those those three Nephi disciples. Uh, so Elder Orson Pratt, one of the early brethren of the Restoration, um, he believed and, and taught that the 144,000 would have power over death and plagues and, and so forth. He said this, quote, How long will they who come from the north countries tarry in the heights of Zion? And that's referring to the return of the lost ten tribes. They, uh, he says, uh, sometime. They have got to raise wheat, cultivate the grape, wine and oil, raise flocks and herds, and their souls will have to become as a watered garden. They will dwell in Zion a good while, and during that time there will be 12,000 chosen out of each of, those, of these 10 tribes, besides 12,000 that will be chosen from Judah, Joseph, and the remaining tribes, 144,000 in all. Chosen for what? To be sealed in their foreheads. For what purpose? so that the power of death and pestilence and plague that will go forth in those days sweeping over the nations of the earth will have no power over them. These parties who are sealed in their foreheads will go forth among all people, nations and tongues, and gather up and hunt out the house of Israel wherever they are scattered and bring as many as they possibly can into the church of the firstborn, preparatory to the great day of the coming of the Lord. 144,000 missionaries, quite a host. All this has got to take place. Close quote. Um, so that's pretty cool. That's a cool description. Um, and, and Elder Pratt, Orson Pratt, uh, taught this in a little more depth on another occasion. Uh, I, I really, I really like this, this quote. And, and I think it uh, establishes at least that it was his belief that, uh, that these, uh, these high priests who are uh, the 144,000 would be uh, translated, their bodies would be, would be changed and upgraded. Uh, so see if you can pick that out of, of this. Quote, when the temple is built, this is talking about the New Jerusalem temple, uh, the sons of the two priesthoods, that is those who are ordained to the priesthood of Melchizedek, that priesthood which is after the order of the Son of God with all its appendages, and those who have been ordained to the priesthood of Aaron with all its appendages, the former called the sons of Moses, the latter the sons of Aaron, will enter into that temple in this generation or in the generation that was living in 1832, and all of them who are pure in heart will behold the face of the Lord. And that too before he comes in his glory in the clouds of heaven. For he will suddenly come to his temple, and he will purify the sons of Moses and of Aaron until they shall be prepared to offer in that temple an offering that shall be acceptable in the sight of the Lord. In doing this, he will purify not only the minds of 
the priesthood in that temple, but he will purify their bodies until they shall be quickened, renewed, and strengthened. And they will be partially changed, not to immortality, but changed in part that they can be filled with the power of God, and they can stand in the presence of Jesus and behold his face in the midst of that temple. This will prepare them for further ministrations among the nations of the earth. It will prepare them to go forth in the days of tribulation and vengeance upon the nations of the wicked, when God will smite them with pestilence, plague, and earthquake, such as former generations never knew. Then the servants of God will need to be armed with the power of God. They will need to have that sealing blessing pronounced upon their foreheads, that they can stand forth in the midst of these de desolations and plagues and not be overcome by them. When, the, when John the Revelator describes this scene, he says he saw four angels sent forth, ready to hold the four winds that should blow from the four quarters of heaven. Another angel ascended from the east and cried to the, to the four angels and said, Smite not the earth now, but wait a little while. How long? Until the servants of God are sealed in their foreheads. What for? To prepare them to stand forth in the midst of these desolations and plagues and not be overcome. When they are prepared, when they have received a renewal of their bodies in the Lord's temple and have been filled with the Holy Ghost and purified as gold and silver in a furnace of fire, then they will be prepared to stand before the nations of the earth and preach glad tidings of salvation in the midst of judgments that are to come like a whirlwind upon the wicked. Close quote. Uh, so, and he mentioned uh, those living in 1832. Interestingly, uh, a number of patriarchal blessings were given by uh, by Joseph Smith Sr. in particular, um, and I, I believe some by Hiram Smith also that uh, that mentioned that uh, that certain saints were uh, destined to become uh, 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 numbered among the 144,000. So, and some of these uh, have have since passed away. So, uh, it may be that this uh, this body is made up of of translated beings and and possibly also resurrected beings. Uh, Either way, they, they'll have the same mission and, and have power over, over all of these things. So that, that's uh, super exciting, I think. Um, now, something interesting I've observed about uh, both John the Apostle and about the three Nephite disciples is that they all requested translation from the Savior. He didn't ask any of them to, to tarry on the earth. They all volunteered. It was their desire to do that. If that's true, then is it unrighteous for you or I to have this same desire? Um, I don't believe that all of us need to have that desire. After all, the majority of, of Jesus' apostles and, and Nephite disciples desired to, to pass into the spirit world and into Jesus' presence when their mortal missions were completed. Um, but I think there are some who have uh, a desire uh, like John and the three Nephites and, and I think that's good. And, and, uh, and President Joseph Fielding Smith uh, would agree, and he, he taught this, quote, This certainly is a great honor to be one of the 144,000 who are specially called by the power of the angels to whom, it is given over, to whom it is given power over the nations of the earth to bring souls unto Christ. John the Apostle had the great desire to bring souls to Christ. The three Nephite disciples likewise sought this great honor, and it was granted to them. It is one of the noblest desires that a man can have. It will be a wonderful blessing to those who are called in this great group. Close quote. Now, it, it really should be obvious to, to all of us that we are truly living in the latter part of the latter days. How many of us are, are seeking to know what our latter day missions are? What is the Lord willing to reveal to those who ask and who are willing to accept a role in this great winding up scene. Um, I invite each of us to, to live in such a way that we can receive personal and specific revelation for our own lives and, and for those we might have stewardship over. Uh, I believe there are many whom the Lord is now preparing to fill important missions, building up Zion, uh, preaching the gospel and, and gathering scattered Israel, uh, missions like that, uh, and, and all of the supporting roles that are involved in, in those things as well. Uh, it's my hope and my prayer that, that we, that you and I, may be among 
those who will stand on Mount Zion with our Savior, whether in the flesh or in the spirit. Um, I hope we'll be, we'll be there with him when he comes um, to rule and, and reign over this earth as, as her king. And I leave that with you in the sacred name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.